The cliffs of Dover, high, austere bulwarks of defense. Only two years ago, they represented home and safety to the deserted British Army at Dunkirk. Was it only two years ago when we saw the little ships creep in under the shelter of these cliffs and land the tattered, dirty, but still cheery British Expeditionary Force? Was it only two years ago that the British behind these cliffs trained and drilled while the factories worked and sweated to replace the arms that had to be left behind? It seems an old story now, but it was only two years ago. Behind these cliffs, Britain stood alone at bay. And as we know now, with nothing much beyond a high courage and a resolve to die with its boots on, the British people awaited the blow they knew must fall. And so it was with no surprise that in those drowsy August days of 1940, the inhabitants of Dover heard the droning buzz of German bombers. This is it, they said, and went on with their allotted work. And then the few to whom we owe so much smashed the Germans from the sky, and the front line became a graveyard for German airplanes and German corpses. All this is old history now. But the front line is still there. The cliffs still look across at German France. What's it like in the front line country now? It looks much the same, except that the shattered aircraft have long since gone, and their flyers are buried in the little village cemetery, or in the fresh fields where the grass has long since covered the marks of their destruction. Does this mean that the front line, in peacetime called the Garden of England, has cleared up its war damage, buried its dead, and gone to sleep again? Certainly not. The front line of Britain is still very much alive. And what's more, it's got a new spirit. It no longer says, this is it, or here they come. It says, look out, Gary, here we come. It's maybe taken us those two years, but the front line is all set to be the United Nations jumping off board. Britain's garden is going to dish it out. Here's some people who'll tell you all about it. This is one of the places where Navy men and soldiers are training for invasion. These flat-bottom, armor-plated craft are assault landing craft, which together with other similar types of vessels, are Britain's invasion barges. Round our front line, Britain has accumulated a vast fleet of these boats, and someday a new armada will sail. But this one will be going the opposite way to the last. Of course, they've been used already. Listen to Abel Seaman Fletcher. When I first started making these raids on enemy territory, I had to put the pongos ashore in the rowing boats. What do you mean by pongos? Oh, pongos are what the sailors call the soldiers. And here is Lieutenant John Lewis. We have craft here that have been used at the Fulton, Borgzo, Grunewald, and Boulogne. Our training is purely offensive. We take commandos and blokes like that on the other side on reconnaissance raids. The journey over and the landing itself is not much. But the worst part is waiting to take the soldiers off. What we have done so far is real small fry. But we are now waiting to show you what we can do in a real big way. But the frontline country is not just waiting to have a go at Hitler. It's preparing. It's a vast camp. Everywhere are convoys. On the quiet hills, tank squadrons maneuver and rehearse. Britain's citizen army, tough now and equipped with the finest weapons from the home and American factories, is putting the final polish to its training. And the defensive jobs are now largely taken by women. Here's a mixed anti-aircraft battery practicing. Hey! Bombs and splinters, but not as many as the Germans have had from our guns. Hey, no, no, but what are the civilians who are still in the camp? They've been carrying on as well as the services. Let's go and have a look at Dover. Well, it's here, all right. Two more houses down, though. 
The old Grand Hotel where we reporters waited for Hitler has gone. And the Burlington stopped one, too. But the Salvation Army is still here and playing as well as ever. And there's the mayor out taking a stroll. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Good afternoon, my daughter. Tell us about Dover, Mr. Mayor. Dover's quite all right, as I told you last time. We are all very busy doing our jobs and looking after troops. We have our problems and our tragedies. They still have their tragedies. Driven from the inland towns by night fighters, the Nazi bombers that were to blast Britain into subjection are now forced to make hit-and-run raids on harmless seaside towns. Scuttling across the channel, they drop their bombs at random and then make for home. But despite it all, the innate optimism and cheerfulness of the English man or woman in the street prevails. Back at Dover, I met what I think is a typical inhabitant, Mrs. McEwen. I think you folks would like to meet her. Well, what do you want me to do this time? Just tell the folks what life is like in the front line. Well, it seems pretty much the same. Plenty of bombing and shelling. We've got used to that now. If it's got your name on it, you'll get it. The only thing that's really worrying me is, although the rations are being cut, I haven't got any glimmer. That's the spirit of the front line. After two years of bombing and shelling, she still laughs and thinks of her figure. But there's a reason for her cheerfulness. She knows that now, for every bomb or shell she dodges, the Germans try to dodge half a dozen. Mrs. McEwen symbolizes the optimistic spirit which is the most striking feature of Britain today. Let them do their worst. They'll get it back. But it's what's happening in the air over the front line that really keeps the Mrs. McEwen's cheering. For months, every time she heard the drone of squadrons, she knew without looking up that it was the enemy. But now she knows just as instinctively that such a drone means that they're ours. Every day, every night, the sky above the front line is full of aircraft, and all busy bashing the bomb. Let's visit a front line aerodrome. Here's Flight Lieutenant Johnston, DFC, back from his 68th sweep. Any claims, Johnny? Uh, 109 destroyed, but yes. Oh, good show. Where about is this? Uh, just inside Dunkirk, about 30,000 feet. Couldn't you that? Sure. Oh, what's the story? Well, we were burned from the sun by it. 45109s. After a bit of the shambles, I got on the tail of one. What range? Well, up to 50 yards. Cannon and machine gun. And I saw his engine on fire and large pieces from the main plane. Well, that seems well confirmed anyway. Thanks, pal. And here's Wing Commander Manal, who leads a stirring squadron. He's just back from Cologne. Piece of cake, old boy. We waltzed over, dropped her on the target, waltzed back again and never saw a thing. And so it goes on. By day, fighter and bomber sweeps. Strip fires for high and medium cover and hurricanes for close escort. Blenheims and Boston bombers. Blasting factories and powerhouses supplying the Germans. Shooting up freight trains and gun sites. Hurricane bombers and Beaufort torpedo planes smashing convoys. Huge four-engine Lancasters setting out for the heart of Germany. going to stick it till the boys go over the other side. Then we'll have a jolly good holiday, won't we, Father? Certainly will, Joe. <laughs>
This is a war of cargo ships. The shipyards of America are working day and night. But building them is only half the job. Crews must be built too, and built fast. A hundred thousand men must learn the ways of ships in two short years. Here at Hopton Island in Lower New York Bay, experienced seamen learn new things about new ships, new ways to meet new dangers. Handling a lifeboat is not easy. A torpedo doesn't wait for men to learn. Trained men, experienced men, know what to do. Boat drill is the order. One hour every day for four months. Target practice. American seamen are trained to meet the unexpected. They're ready for whatever danger strikes. Broadside and anti-aircraft guns give the crews and our bridge of ships a crack at lurking submarines and surface raiders. A better chance to save their lives and cargo. Nothing that can protect the men and ships from wartime dangers is overlooked. Gas rescue work is vital when fire strikes at sea. Another case when knowing how saves lives. Actual work in the ship's machine shop and with the welding torch makes it possible to repair breakdowns and damage at sea. Ships move on. They're not laid up in port so often or so long. At Gallup's Island in Boston Harbor, hundreds of young men qualify as sports in from six to nine months. They learn code and typing together, preparing for a necessary and time-honored profession. They learn a democratic discipline, stern but necessary to the safety of any ship. The rules of seamanship and conduct that fit them for a job at sea. United States Merchant Marine Cadet Corps trains officers for the complex job of running a modern ship. Navigation, to steer a ship and steer it through, to know the compass, to deliver cargoes safely. Shooting the sun, to use a section to find the ship's position, latitude and longitude. Read the charts and plot a course along the right sea lanes, moving with wind and tide and current, steering clear of danger. Learn the signals, bells and whistles, to use the telegraph from bridge to engine room, to understand the instruments and gauges, how to read them and what each has to tell. Powerful modern engines guide our victory fleet. The men who run them get a thorough training for their important task. At historic Fort Trumbull in New London, Connecticut, and at Government Island in San Francisco Bay, training stations have been established for officers up from the ranks. These are older men with sea experience. Going back to school now to learn the things that officers must know. Mathematics or navigation and engineering. Spherical trigonometry and calculus. The American seaman and her sister ship, the American sailor, are the largest training vessels maintained by any government in the world. More than 300 men are trained at one time on each of these ships. 
and on more than a dozen other trading vessels, including one of the Maritime Commission's 1,500 new Liberty ships. Tough, reliable, capable cargo ships. Built to do a job and doing it. The waterfront cities, small towns and farms, boys and young men come to these trading courses. All young Americans are eligible, and sailors in our merchant fleet are just as important in this war as soldiers in the army. No previous experience is necessary, only a healthy body, a clean character, and a mind alert and quick to learn. Hard work and study call for good food and plenty of it. Cooks and bakers are trained at all apprentice seamen training units, and they know their stuff. A seaman has to know a lot of things. He starts with simple chores. The box of compass and a class on deck. To know his ropes and how to tie sailors' knots. To handle lines and strike a hawser. To know the meaning of the signal flag. To read and send messages in code with semaphore. These are a few of many things he learns. The day's work starts with washing down the deck. Both ships and men are better if they're clean. Down to work and classes. To learn by watching and by doing. To light a new oil burner beneath a boiler. Men work better when they know the how and why. Here they learn them well. Ship. Boat drill. In these grim days, a seaman's work's no fishing trip, no Sunday picnic, no moonlight excursion with soft music. It's not a job for chicken hearted fellows. It's for men with guts and good red blood. It's hard work with danger in it. But training for emergency cuts down the danger. And training today takes full account of every lurking threat. Come what may, trained men know what to do. That's why there's more and more of this knowing by doing. Learning how to launch a lifeboat. Learning to go over the side and how to operate the many kinds of lifeboats, rafts, and launches. Graduation muster. They're full trained seamen now, ready to serve their country in the way they've chosen, ready for storm or danger or peace with the sea. In the greatest war the world has ever known, we fight with our lives. We are the United Nations, united across the seas by a bridge of ships. Convoys bound for many fronts, American seamen do their job. They'll get the planes and tanks and guns and food the Army needs to where it needs them. Ships and brave men working together make it possible to fight. So we're building ships at scores of ports along our coast. Building ports in Denver and Kansas City and Pittsburgh. And sending them by railroad to the sea. There to be joined, riveted and welded, launched and sailed away. Soon, three a day, 2,300 merchant ships before the end of 1943 will come from the United States shipyards. The Maritime Commission is building the ships, and the War Shipping Administration is training the men to sail them. If you have never been to sea, but want to be trained for a sea job, apply to the local office of the United States Employment Service or the War Shipping Administration's enrolling office in your city.